Great. Good morning and good afternoon. Um, I just want to welcome everybody on behalf from the German Marshall Fund of the United States, our partners at the Rondelli Foundation. We want to welcome you to today's conversation on the upcoming uh, Georgian election. Uh, my name is Jonathan Katz. I'm a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund in Washington. I'm also director of democracy initiatives uh, mm -hmm. at GMF and um, really excited for today's conversation uh, again on, on the election. I want to welcome our speakers today to our guests, panelists um, uh, who are representing leading political parties in, in Georgia. Uh, you know, this is an incredibly busy time for them, and I deeply appreciate uh, their joining us for this conversation. And also for those that are joining us, uh, participating uh, in the audience as well, this virtual audience. So thank you. And I want to say this is a, truly a, a great opportunity for, for the transatlantic perspective to, to also be discussed. Uh, we have people joining us from across uh, uh, North America, but also uh, in, in Europe as well as in Georgia. Um, and this is going to be a great opportunity, I think, for us here on uh, sort of in Washington in particular, but also in Brussels and elsewhere to hear more about uh, the issues at hand in Georgia um, and also enable everybody who's participating to offer up some, some keen questions about uh, uh, of concern to them. One thing I wanted to just highlight, of course, you know, from the U.S. perspective, uh, Georgia is seen as a, and, and I believe this is shared in the transatlantic context, that Georgia is seen as, as a strategic partner. Um, obviously, uh, looking from, from Washington, uh, today we're going to have the foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia in Washington uh, meeting with Secretary Pompeo. So uh, the South Caucasus, Georgia, are very much uh, in our uh, are in our scopes right now, um, and we understand that there are both both domestic and regional challenges. You know, some of the domestic challenges that will be discussed today are issues like COVID nineteen, which is a, not only just domestic but a global issue. Came up in our debate last night in the United States, our presidential debate. But also, we're talking about economy, and when we hear. Uh, the World Bank and other multilaterals talking about deep recessions uh, in places like the South Caucasus. You know, we have to be concerned both externally uh, and also uh, if you're Georgian, uh, because the international community is dealing with a pandemic that has wreaked tremendous havoc on economies. And so today is really an opportunity. I really appreciate it to hear from you on, on these issues, the socioeconomic challenges, economy, um, the issue of Euro-Atlantic integration of uh, democratic reforms, judicial reforms. Um, you know, our, our speakers are knee deep in sort of addressing these issues, whether they're representing part political parties or whether they're looking at it from the perspective of, of parliamentarians uh, that are working daily on these issues. So we really appreciate this opportunity. And I'm 100% certain that there's a couple of issues that will likely come up you know, including on the foreign policy side, uh, the role of Russia internally concerns that, that in the United States that were actually shared last night at our presidential debate about the continued interference um, of, of Russia in elections. Uh, and I think Georgia um, has experienced this in a way that, that most countries have not, uh, really a frontline country. So we don't wanna necessarily focus just on those issues because there's also all politics is local and I think our, our three speakers uh, know this better than anybody else. Um, and we can get to the challenging geostrategic issues from the regional challenges of Nagorno-Karabakh to uh, Georgia's challenges of internal security and territorial integrity. Uh, and uh, you know, we can absolutely sort of parody and echo the words of US Ambassador uh, uh, Degnan who said that, you know, that the United States, and I've, I've seen this from other partners in Europe that they want to see a free, fair, and transparent election and are very much looking forward to uh, both the election, but also what comes after this election. Um, and with new electoral changes that have taken place over the last several months um, has really scrambled uh, Georgia's political landscape. And not all can be solved today because you have to have a vote first. 
Uh, but I think from the perspective of, of Washington or Brussels or partners uh, you know, of Georgia, uh, most important is to see Georgia's democratic path continue. Uh, and then on our end, our commitment to continue to work with Georgia on its Euro-Atlantic integration path uh, with whatever government is in place. And I think that that's, that's the message of today. With that said, I am gonna um, send it over uh, and sort of bring in Eka Metravelli, who's my co-partner for today's uh, conversation uh, in Tbilisi. Eka, can I bring you into the conversation and sort of hand the, 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 the keys over to you? And uh, really, again, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you again to our panelists. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation and uh, to uh, understanding better the key challenges facing Georgia in the lead up to this election, but also the thinking about uh, beyond this election, because there's a number of challenges uh, that will not uh, abate just because you have the election. There's, there's governance and the need to, to work on challenging issues. Eka, um, so I'm gonna send it over mm -hmm. to you, see. And thank you again for, for everybody joining. One last point, housekeeping. Uh, please feel free as we're going, uh, as our speakers, panelists are speaking, to pose questions. Um, and uh, we've talked to them beforehand about a number of key topic areas to touch on, you know, as part of this conversation. But we want you to uh, to use a Q and A function in Zoom and start posing questions uh, as soon as you want to. So, Eka, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for this great initiative and GMF's interest in Georgia. It's important that despite the upcoming elections in the US and pandemic and all related issues, our friends and partners in the United States are still paying close attention to Georgia's elections as their support is extremely important paramount in our development as a democratic viable state. Today, as you've mentioned, we have a pleasure to host here um, representatives of three major parliamentary parties, Georgian Dream, United Nations Movement Europe, and European Georgia, to discuss the upcoming elections and as well as what these parties offer to Georgia's future. We have three distinguished speakers represented. Um, the United Nations Movement um, is represented by Salome Samadashvili. Ms. Samadashvili has been a member of the parliament for several times, as well as has extensive foreign service experience, including being Georgia's ambassador to the EU. Uh, Sergei Kapanadze, European Georgia, is a deputy speaker of the parliament and former deputy minister of foreign affairs. And last but not least, uh, we have here Georgi Felashvili, who is a relatively newcomer to politics. Georgi is a new face, but stepped in as one of the leading figures of the proportional list of the ruling party. Georgi also has a background in foreign service in addition to academia, and he was a deputy chief of mission in the US at the uh, Georgian embassy. Thank you, dear panelists, for being with us, for joining us. We know how busy you are in this pre-election period. And I would like to join jo Jonathan uh, before actually getting to the conversation in, re uh, in greeting the audience, both in Tbilisi and in the United States. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. And I would like to ask you to send the questions which we will gather and pose to the panelists in due course. Uh, only about a week is left uh, until uh, October 31st uh, parliamentary elections. And since the word independence, Georgian elections have never been dull and the pre-election period has always been characterized as a uh, dynamic and our elections have always been um, called as a test for Georgia's democratic uh, development. And this time the picture is the same, this election is not an exception, but in addition, it has uh, even different peculiarities. And first of all, it's the COVID situation, which is getting worse on a daily basis. And it makes uh, quite a complicated situation for the parties and for the um, society to you know, participate in the pre-election process. And another thing which makes this election special is the new electoral system, as mentioned by Jonathan, out of 150, 120 uh, mandates will be distributed through proportional system with the electoral threshold standing at 1%. And this creates a real chance for a more diverse representation in the next parliament and the reality that the parties might face, which is a need to create a coalition government, which would be a turning point in the political life of Georgia that has been always polarized, engaging, 
in this process, media and various segments of society pose a threat to national security. Thus, this is the new system which, which might create the new opportunities. But the new electoral system also opens a chance for a smaller pro-Russian radical parties to get into the parliament, which is connected with the issue of Russia's attempt to influence Georgia's foreign as well as domestic policies. And there is an example of that interference is the alleged funding of the Alliance of Patriots, also a parliamentary party by Russia. Unfortunately, we have not received an official you know, answer on these allegations yet. But these are the kind of threats and opportunities. Um, and uh, now I would like to give to each of the panelists up to seven minutes to make their opening remarks, but also to try to touch base on this new electoral system, opportunities and threats to Georgia's democratic development and national security, and specifically what this new reality of political life can bring to Georgia and how you see the role of your parties in this process. And I would like to give the floor first. Each of the panelists uh, has uh, seven minutes. I would like to ask you to be um, really short and precise. And um, Ms. Amadashvili, uh, let's start uh, you know, with you and then Sergei and Georgi. Thank right. you. Thank you, Eka. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for putting this panel together because indeed the COVID-19 has created the new reality and uh, one of the main differences between these elections and all the other ones that were held recently is that we have, of course, much less international presence on the ground. Therefore, we particularly appreciate an opportunity to address today the international audience um, uh, with respect to the um, concerns and opportunities of the upcoming elections. So uh, what are at stakes? What is at stake in these elections? Um, as you know, Georgia has undergone the first democratic change of government in 2012 um, through the elections in its you know, modern history. And uh, even though it was to some extent a lost opportunity since the change of the government was followed with the political uh, prosecutions against the uh, opposition uh, politicians, exile of some and, <clears throat> uh, and basically a crackdown on opposition and media, uh, still, it was an important historical um, development. So uh, today, as we speak, uh, and as Georgia is preparing to uh, conduct uh, historical parliamentary elections in, uh, you know, basically one week uh, time, this presents uh, a unique opportunity for our country to undergo through the second change of government through democratic elections in its history, and uh, this makes this election's landmark. Uh, now, uh, of course, in order to achieve that, first of all, we need to have um, uh, indeed free and fair elections. And uh, if you allow me, I, will, um, I want to spend uh, some time on the pre-election environment in the country because this is extremely important. As it has been mentioned, um, uh, indeed, we have a new constitutional system uh, thanks to the um, US and EU uh, missions in Georgia, diplomatic missions in Georgia and our partners mediation, we have been able to negotiate the new constitutional framework after Ivanishvili uh, basically took back the promise to move to the fully proportional system of the elections. And uh, today, as we are facing elections in one week, it is quite clear why he was so concerned not to let the proportional uh, elections take place uh, in this election cycle. According to every independent poll conducted by the organizations with high international reputation, such as Edison Research or Ipsos International, uh, Ivanishvili's party, and I will be referring to Ivanishvili as the government in my speech uh, today and in my remarks, because of course the first abnormal uh, in political development that we have in this country and that we want to end in one week's time is the fact that countries governed informally uh, by the uh, by oligarch Bidzina Ivanishvili, who uh, made his fortune in Russia, has no elected position in the country, and still he's the sole decision maker and he runs the country for eight years, basically. So uh, as Ivanishvili, uh, it was important for Ivanishvili to um, uh, basically block the change to the full proportional system, because according to every poll, 
his party Georgian dream is polling around 40%. And that means a clear um, defeat in the proportional elections in the upcoming elections. Uh, where there, there is a main battleground is the 30 single mandate majoritarian seats, which for the specificities of our election uh, environment, because the government uses very effectively administrative and financial resources in the majoritarian districts, Traditionally, the government parties have the um, strong showing in those in, in the single mandate district. So today, one could say that the fate of the election hangs on the outcome of the majoritarian races. And uh, therefore, we see uh, that while the overall environment before the elections is um, unfortunately not anything better than what we have seen the previous elections, meaning uh, threatening of the opposition uh, supporters, using the administrative and financial resources by the state uh, for its political for the political advantage of the of the governing party, the uh, politically motivated election administration that basically works for the govern governing party. In addition to this, uh, we also see a particularly violent campaigns in the majoritarian districts where the opposition candidates have a very good chance of winning the elections. For example, uh, the chair of the UNM, uh, UNM Council, Nick Melia, is running in one of Tbilisi districts. His uh, supporters were attacked. So they you know, were throwing stones at them. There was shooting in another region uh, against uh, our uh, supporters uh, because our candidate there is very strong. So a lot of violent outbreaks around the country um, and it is extremely dangerous. And unfortunately, we don't see the government taking the measures to prevent this by investigating or punishing the, um, the, uh, you know, the facts of violence. So, um, uh, well, Ivanishvili is clearly nervous and uh, he has a reason to be uh, very nervous because the, um, what we see from the same polls is basically that uh, the public mood in the country is very, very strongly against his government. Uh, why is the mood, um, you know, basically again is the governing party, uh, not for any other reasons than in any other country, uh, we have uh, economy which has basically not been growing for a long time, GDP per capita of Georgia has, um, you know, is the half of the that of the poorest European country like Bulgaria and has not grown in a while. We see uh, extremely high unemployment rates. And of course the COVID has added to already ailing, uh, ailing Georgian you know, economy in this country. And the COVID itself has turned into a new sour spot on the ailing body of this government because basically in the beginning, uh, in the spring, we had very low numbers and it was clear that the Georgian dream was hoping to campaign on the success of defeating the pandemic, and now as we are entering the, uh, you know, basically pre-election week, uh, the number of COVID cases keeps growing, and the health system is basically already collapsing, with 911 calls remaining unanswered and uh, people in need of the medical help which they uh, cannot receive. So um, the situation is turning more and more difficult for the Georgians and. The government is responding, unfortunately, not by presenting the policies that will be convincing to the Georgian voters that um, they actually have something new and important to offer to them, but by uh, continuing the policy of basically uh, prosecuting the opposition and the opposition politicians. I want to um, mention just uh, briefly- Shalom, so you have a minute left. I have a minute left. Okay, um, so um, I want to briefly mention two of the most pressing cases uh, because uh, recently two um, senior, uh, basically senior citizens who are, um, who are uh, scientists and cartographers were arrested 
on bogus charges of uh, having, uh, I don't know, conceded the Georgian territories to Azerbaijan in the process of demarcation of our border. And the real target is, of course, uh, former President Saakashvili, but that government wants to, you know, trump up uh, again this case before the elections and create some new uh, political um, charges against Saakashvili. Another case is uh, the case of uh, businessman Georgi Rurua, who remains in prison as a political prisoner on uh, fabricated charges of illegal possession of arm because, arms because he basically uh, dared to fund independent TV station and opposition in this country. Uh, and the, the owner of another independent TV station in Georgia was just two days ago was threatened uh, with murder. And uh, it remains uninvestigated to this day what, what, what has happened uh, with this particular case. So, um, you know, in seven minutes, I, you know, cannot discuss also our way forward and what are our, you know, program ideas, what we are presenting to the voters, but I hope that in the question and answer uh, period, I will have a chance to address those because right now I just wanted to share with you the environment in which we are entering this, um, you know, vitally important pre-election week here in Georgia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Samadashvili. Yeah, it's obvious in seven minutes we cannot fill in everything, but we have a time and I'm sure the issues which you have raised will be followed on uh, closely by the audience. Uh, thank you. And with this, I will proceed to um, Mr. Kapanadze. Sergey, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. So in seven minutes, maybe I will touch on uh, five issues. One on the uh, national security issues, the second on the internal security, third on COVID, fourth economy, fifth in seven minutes. So to start, one, the out outer security. That's uh, a very precarious situation for Georgia, obviously, because of the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, and because of the uncertainties around the outcome of that conflict, which is a serious security concern for us in the medium to long run, taking into account that this jeopardizes the investment climate in the country, and in general, the balance of power inside the region. So that is a huge concern with no one, with no clear outcome. Um, the second part of this is obviously the role of Russia, who is probably now on the, on the watch out, um, taking opportunities, uh, taking chances, uh, and, and waiting for the unfolding of the conflict. As we all know, in the last years, Russia has become extremely strong toward Georgia because of different reasons, because of our increasing dependence on it, as well as because of the rise of the pro-Russian forces internally, who are either funded uh, or are very dependent on them, or who are spreading the same message box that, that Moscow has, and obviously with no serious uh, counter steps on the side of the government to counter them. In fact, I think the government has done everything to ensure that they operate freely without any problems. So that's one thing. The second one is the internal security issues. Uh, particularly concerning in the last days. Uh, in the last uh, months and years, we've seen the rise of crime you know, in general, which is a, a serious concern uh, for every citizen here. We've seen a number of high profile cases uh, which have either not been solved or have made the headlines uh, and have created the, the, the aura of uh, unpunishedness of, the, of, of people uh, getting the feeling that they are neither secure and for the criminals, the rising feeling that they can get away with the crime, especially since a lot of criminal elements are used uh, very widely by the government during the pre-election period, they're assisting each other. Uh, and so that has created a, a serious uh, a problem um, uh, for the security of the country in terms of crime. We saw yesterday a, a very uh, concerning uh, uh, development when actually the day before yesterday, we had a hostage situation in one of the banks the hostage taker managed to get away with the money that was given to him by the government. And then we saw a very concerning statement by the uh, government saying that, yes, they will pay off whatever is requested as a ransom, whether it's a million or more. And now we've seen an increasing number of uh, crimes just during the last two days. I'm not saying it's a, it's a result of that particular, I would say very unfortunate statement by the Minister of Interior, uh, not the policy of not negotiating with the terrorists and the hostage takers, but, but declaring the policy that they will buy out anybody who takes the hostage. The second thing, the third, the COVID. Salome spoke about it extensively. I would just add maybe a few words. I think uh, we have now a, a serious abyss in front of us 
in terms of the COVID situation, we've had the, 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 the dramatic rise of the numbers in the last um, uh, weeks and days in particular. We are now close to 1,700 a day. And taking into account that in uh, April, March, uh, when we had 20, 25 a day, it was, uh, it was uh, followed by a, a nationwide lockdown, basically or if not the nationwide lockdown by serious economic restrictions and it effectively killed the economy at that time. Now with this uh, outbreak, it's really unclear what awaits us uh, up front. We have also the rising, rising number of deaths, but most concerning is that we don't see that the government has prepared for it. And I will not go into details here. If there are questions, I can follow up on them, but we have very concerning information about how unprepared actually the government is in terms of the readiness of the of the medical staff in terms of the readiness of the COVID beds in terms of the availability of the tests etc and with these numbers raising very fast and with the government making a statement that they will not do the lockdown uh, um, as I understand because before the election it's a very unpopular measure I think we are heading towards an extremely wrong direction the fourth point economy um, as I said we've had a, a serious economic uh, recession during this year um, minus five already, uh, according to the official numbers, probably will get worse than that. Um, we've had uh, what I believe was a very unfortunate squandering of the state resources during this period where we should have prepared for the COVID. Um, and now a very uncertain future um, ahead. Uh, we've lost uh, around 45,000 jobs in the 2016-2019 period, also official statistics, uh, and added another lost uh, uh, different numbers, but close to you know, officially what we know, 60,000, but the Deputy Minister of Finance said a few days ago, up to 100,000 this year in the private sector. So that is a, one of the biggest job losses uh, in a short period of time that we've encountered in, in the last year. So there's no clear vision how that can be overcome. Now, if I have the opportunity later in the Q&A, maybe we can talk about what our vision for that is, but the, the outcome is extremely bleak for us and even when um, the World Bank and the IMF say that we can expect 5% growth next year, knowing how um, optimistic they usually are, probably is that we will have either a recession or, or another uh, low percentage growth next year. And the final point on the democracy, uh, you know, uh, those of you who follow our, uh, those of you who, who follow Georgia know the situation in which we are, it is Mr. Dimanishvil, the oligarch who runs the country at his own whim, effectively um, running the party and the government uh, uh, and the state uh, unilaterally um, with a lot of uh, people loyal to them, uh, who is now going for the third term. The first time in the Georgia's history that uh, somebody is uh, poised to get uh, the third term and if they succeed, which I'm sure they will not, it will be the first time somebody will uh, be at the, at the helm for the third consecutive term. So. Uh, that leads me to the elect election point, which we have in one week, as Salome already said, as you probably all know, and this electoral period is, is uh, characterized by a lot of irregularities already, uh, with the violence, with the vote buying, uh, with you know, throwing stones and, uh, and um, uh, uh, intimidation of the activists and the, and the, and the, and the party members. Uh, we've seen an extremely dirty campaign in the last one week, uh, where the pro-government uh, media uh, is basically engaged in uh, uh, demonizing the opposition, um, uh, blaming on them things that are incredible, including by, for instance, the, the day before yesterday's hostage situation was effectively blamed on the opposition as if it was staged by the opposition. So you understand uh, how sick is the pre-electoral environment here. And I would really want to stress again the point which was mentioned before, the, uh, the case of the cartographers where two extremely, absolutely innocent people have been jailed. Uh, uh, and the public uh, uh, propaganda is that they sold uh, uh, the David Gareji Monastery, which is an, an important monastery for Georgian tradition, uh, history, culture. Uh, and so, you know, even in the official uh, charge brought against them, this place is not even mentioned. So they are there for nothing, for a simply political purpose just to, uh, you know, just to demonstrate that the previous government uh, has uh, been selling lands. And now, uh, Jonathan, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, we're in the, uh, you know, like, just like in the United States, we're approaching the electoral period. You mentioned the, uh, the debates. 
one thing I think everybody should know, in Georgia, we do not have the debates, unlike the, the, the United States. You know, we all watched probably, I did, I'm sure you also did the presidential debates in the US. In Georgia, we do not have the debates because the government does not go to the opposition channel. It's one, one minute left, sorry. I will have 30 seconds, I'm actually done. The government does not go to the opposition channels and the, and the government media does not invite the opposition for, for the debate. So we have not had a single substantial debate between the government and the opposition. So that right there is a verdict, what kind of democracy uh, are we living? And yes, the situation is extremely polarized. My last point, that is, it's a polarized situation in which both major parties, the Georgian Dream and the UNM try to polarize for their uh, party purposes. I absolutely understand that. But the situation in the country is actually quite different from that in terms of, um, since we are moving towards the uh, proportional system, there are many other parties who are competing on this uh, field, which both major parties are polarizing. And so I really think, uh, it's not just a wish, but I really believe that the next parliament will be a parliament uh, that will have a, a coalition of the pro-Western forces uh, uh, and not a single party rule, no matter who is that single party. And certainly my big hope is not gonna be the Georgian team. I stop here. Sorry if I exceed my several seconds. No, no, you were just exactly on time. Thank you, such a precise you know, description of the situation and such an analysis. Um, and uh, you have uh, both you and Ms. Amadash really have raised the uh, important questions that you know, probably Georgi would like to comment uh, on. These have been the questions and issues connected with the uh, informal governance um, and uh, the kind of pre-election uh, uh, period process uh, violations, um, uh, uses of the administrative resources and you know, so on. Also the Gareji case has come up uh, both times, uh, both times and the poor preparedness for treatment of the COVID. Georgi, I know that it's opening remarks, but if you would like to comment also on that, you, you know, feel free and floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, I want to greet uh, audience uh, both in Washington and Tbilisi. Good morning and good afternoon, depending where you are. I look forward to discussion and uh, I'm actually thrilled that uh, our uh, policy forum uh, gained so much attention. Um, the three things that I want to concentrate on are what uh, our government has been able to achieve in the last eight years. And these are stability, democratic governance, and uh, more than ever vigorous pro-Western orientation of Georgia. Uh, so Georgia emerged as, a, uh, as an island of democratic stability in the region, despite the uh, challenges especially the recent upheaval, but also uh, many other geopolitical uh, problems that surround us. So the Georgian government's greatest achievement in this uh, geopolitical situation is that we managed to retain and develop effective governance despite, and, and at the same time, democratic standards, despite all the temptations of a growing democracy to somehow um, erode democratic standards and gain any short-term political gains. So despite uh, constant pressure and aggression from Russia, uh, Georgia managed to advance, uh, we managed to advance our relations with our key American, NATO and the European Union allies, and we are poised to join NATO and the European U Union uh, based on our demonstrative commitment, but also our best efforts in the last few years. Um, and this is uh, with the backing of our uh, people whose overwhelming majority is uh, supporting Georgia's integration in the Western institutions. And this is the path that the Georgian dream has taken uh, aggressively and with confidence. We continue also our demonstrated uh, and effective, of, uh, we demonstrate effective governance as we managed, as we navigated the pandemic uh, this spring, and we are now coping with the second wave of the deadly virus. Uh, understandably, as in the rest of the world, and especially the region, the cases are up, but the government who managed to uh, keep the economy afloat and at the same time, keep uh, the damage from the pandemic to a minimum, 
uh, we are sure that we will manage to recover from both economically as well as uh, contain the virus and keep our society healthy. Uh, it's, it would suffice to say that with the modest decline in our economy and the numbers of the uh, fatalities per million, Georgia is uh, occupying one of the best uh, uh, places in the world, probably some, somewhere at the par with Finland and some advanced European countries. So um, Georgia, uh, Georgian dream has given the country a period of stability, which was actually elusive uh, to our people in previous, um, uh, previous um, uh, times. And uh, this is why uh, in previous decades, and this is why uh, the, the people actually very solidly back Georgian uh, dream. And by uh, all credible um, uh, opinion polls, um, Georgian dream is actually getting uh, an outright majority, even in proportional um, sort of uh, voting. Um, and this is why opposition has very little to offer on the substantive, substantive side. And mostly it is about politicking and then criticizing the government and sort of uh, painting an apocalyptic picture so that to invalidate and uh, um, uh, erode the legitimacy of the elections. However, the numbers indicate absolutely the opposite. So um, we are very optimistic and we are looking to the next four years of solid growth and solid development for, for Georgia. And uh, understandably, we are mostly talking about the future rather than about the past. Um, despite the, the noise that surrounds these elections, actually the democratic standards uh, and the con uh, during the conduct of the elections and the transparency has, have never been uh, uh, better than during these elections. So it's the freest, fair, and most uh, uh, fairest and open elections in Georgian history. Uh, and this is due to the constitutional reform that we conducted bringing Georgia to uh, solidly on the path of European parliamentary democracy with the help of our European and American friends. And despite the fact that uh, the opposition actually did not vote for these electoral changes in the parliament. So we are looking to 2024 when we are poised to make a formal pledge to become members of the European Union. And uh, despite all the uh, criticisms, all these uh, actually reforms uh, we are taken, we are led by the chairman of Georgian Dream Party, Mr. Ivanishvili, um, uh, who is uh, still uh, committed uh, to the country's development in the next four years. Um, so uh, the economy is one of the fastest growing in the region, despite the slump, regional slump. And uh, it, is, uh, it will definitely get much better once COVID is over. And uh, uh, the government has a definitive plan for first for containment of the disease and then for the sustainable development of the economy in the coming years. Um, and uh, there are a few other points to make. Uh, importantly, uh, the infrastructural uh, projects, especially that were developed during the Georgian Dream uh, administration are not just for internal development, but they also turn Georgia into a regional hub uh, for um, the regional projects and uh, for the better integration with the European Union. Uh, finally, but not least importantly, uh, we created a social safety net for our citizens in healthcare, in pensions, in social health that uh, had, been, had been non-existent in Georgia before 2012. And this is exactly why the population um, uh, values and appreciates the leadership of the uh, last eight years. And the numbers, I will repeat, clearly indicate an outright victory. Mind you, um, in a parliamentary republic, um, the numbers that we are getting for the, for the polls, which are solidly um, above 50%, 50 uh, are usually considered a landslide. And even the most uh, probably popular international leader uh, in the world, Yacinda Ardern, um, uh, who just won elections in, uh, in uh, New Zealand, uh, polled around 49% uh, while we are getting even, and it was widely acclaimed as a landslide victory, victory, while Georgian Dream is getting numbers that are much better than this. 
Um, and finally, all these elements together make um, Georgia a vibrant democracy uh, with uh, regrettably polarized politics, which are unfortunately opposition driven. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think we will uh, overcome this, um, uh, all the uh, uh, problems, all the challenges that we have for the time with COVID, with economy, uh, with regional upheaval, and then we will head towards the next four years for, for uh, the prospects of uh, much better development in future. Thank you. Um, thank you, Georgi, and you were just in time. Um, I'm sure that the audience will uh, have the questions uh, based on what you'll be just talking about. Um, I see here questions coming regarding the you know, regional hub and connected with that, you know, Anaglia, but that can be you know, asked later on. Right now, as uh, all of you have um, kind of, uh, all the, Georgi has mentioned in his talk and all the parties um, represented here uh, openly announced European integration and becoming UN NATO member uh, as their priority. I would like to kind of dig further here. Recently, um, Executive Secretary of the GD party has announced that um, in case of uh, coming to power in 2024, GD will apply for the membership, um, of EU membership. And uh, Georgi, so you, uh, how realistic you assess this, I would like to hear from you and uh, from Lisa Madashvili as a former ambassador to the EU, as well as Sergei, former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. I would be interested in your position, uh, reflecting, of course, your party's, um, uh, you know, position. Do you share this optimism? And do, what would you do in case of coming uh, to power to revitalize the European UN perspective and accelerate the process, accelerate the process of integration? And I would, uh, I, I believe that the audience both in the United States and in Georgia are, you know, curious to hear your answers. And if we can get this in uh, three minutes, each uh, would be really great. And now re let's um, reverse and let's give first the, um, to Sergei the opportunity and then maybe Georgi and then last one is Samadashvili. Thank you. Uh, on the European integration, well, obviously uh, our party stands for a, for a strong and fast European integration for the full implementation of the association agreement and the and the DCFTA and the visa liberalization and, uh, and seeking the further integration uh, in terms of uh, looking for the uh, new formats of integration because we don't want to be stuck in the Eastern Partnership format and in the association format. And we think that uh, association was a good step forward in 2009 uh, from the neighborhood policy, but uh, we've had 11 years since then. And, uh, staying in this format, especially when all the instruments have been available to us and all the instruments are being implemented and will be implemented. I think it's important now to look for the new uh, formats and the new venues for integration. So we are in favor uh, of uh, you know, indeed applying for the membership. Uh, and I believe that the new coalition government of the pro-Western forces will indeed do that. Uh, and I think that's uh, something that uh, we must do. Uh, obviously in close coordination with our European uh, friends and partners, uh, and also maybe in close coordination with the other Eastern Partnership countries, especially the ones who are on a so-called fast track, the uh, Ukrainian and Moldovan colleagues. Um, now, yes, the, the, the GD uh, has made that a, as a public statement just two weeks before the election that they will be honest because uh, they haven't said that uh, on the record before, they said it just now before the elections, hoping that some people would buy it. Uh, and once again, I don't doubt the sincerity of uh, some people, including George, about the importance of that. What I uh, don't buy, however, is that uh, just two weeks before the election, all of a sudden, the, uh, the oligarch who runs the party and the government and the country at the whim decided that this is uh, the now is the time to talk about that. So it's, it's a simple pre-election thing. Uh, but in general, uh, whether that is the case or not, what I think and hope is that uh, in the next government, there will be a step made towards applying for the membership of the European Union, uh, hoping that what we will receive is will be a warm shoulder and not a cold shoulder. And that will be up to the diplomacy and up to the uh, government, next government of Georgia to make sure that this is the case. Thank you, Serki. And Georgi, would you like to continue on that? 
Yes, I would very much so. Um, well, in the first place, 20, the, the pledge to uh, make a formal um, sort of application to the European Union in 2024 is not an election trick, but it's a plan. It's the plan. Uh, and which means that all government efforts will be concentrated around that uh, pledge and around that purpose. So we signed the association agreement. It was our government that signed the association agreement with the European Union. We signed with it the DCFTA, Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Area with the European Union. And we made an excellent, really excellent use of that resource by actually increasing our exports to the European Union. Just to take an example with 30% from the previous times. And so this is uh, what we are going to uh, do with the European, with, with our membership um, application. In the first place, this will be bringing the European Union uh, more vigorously to help us to unite our country and restore our territorial integrity uh, in terms of the occupation, in terms of uh, non-recognition of these uh, uh, Russian occupied territories. But also we, we consider a sectoral integration with the European Union key to our efforts. And this will be in trade, energy sector, uh, environment protection, which is very important, infrastructural, I already mentioned that in my, in my uh, introduction talk, introductory talk, uh, in, uh, very importantly in uh, agriculture and uh, also education, which will be the uh, real engine for Georgia's development in future. Uh, we are trying to, and we will necessarily do it uh, to use, to make the full use of the Horizon 2020 and also uh, Erasmus programs for our our um, our uh, scholars and our uh, our scientific community and also for our students. And then, um, last but not the least, we'll make our best efforts to uh, improve, further improve physical and uh, people-to-people -people contacts with the European Union, which comprises um, many more direct flights, which we are very few before, but now they are abundant. Uh, well, that's the, of course understanding the COVID debacle uh, with tourism and also with the legal um, uh, uh, work uh, rights of Georgian citizens in the European Union. So these are, of course, then we can make them very, very specific, but um, I think uh, this is just suffice to say. Thank you. Thank you, Georgi. So functional integration that can become a basis for approximation process. and. Um, um, Madam Samadashvili, what would be your um, party's yeah. approach to it? Uh, well, I don't think anyone takes seriously the Georgian Dream's promise to apply for membership in 2024, since, I mean, you know, neither here nor in Brussels, because, um, uh, well, uh, first of all, um, assessing our relationship with the European Union. Uh, indeed, uh, Mr. Kalashvili is right. Um, the Georgian Dream signed the agreement negotiated by the UNM government on the both the association agreement and DCFTA um, because it coincided with um, you know 2012 basically you know they came into power and they had to sign those agreements and obviously um, uh, with the country where the large majority of citizens very strongly support the Euro-Atlantic integration uh, no government has choice to retract from uh, those agreements. The question is, though, uh, to look very closely uh, how those agreements are actually used and implemented, because, um, you know, maybe Mr. Kalashvili does not know much about the uh, way the EU integration works, but uh, it's pretty much, um, you know, like uh, doing your homework. And if you have not done your homework, you cannot go any farther. Uh, so the truth is, the very sad truth, of course, is that under Ivan Yashili's government, um, Russia's economic influence in the country has been growing. I mean, I want to remind you the, uh, the infrastructural projects such as Anaklia port, which was basically um, uh, thrown out of window by Ivan Yashili under Russian request. And uh, the trade with the European Union is actually uh, growing at a very slow pace. Uh, just to give you an example, 
Georgia should be a major agricultural uh, food importer to the European Union. As of today, we are importing only four kinds of agricultural products to the European markets. Uh, as far as the association agreement is con uh, concerned, the European Union has very serious concerns regarding the high level corruption and uh, the justice uh, and law, uh, the law system in our country. And until Georgia manages to address those problems and implement uh, the association agreement fully, demonstrate that it can take advantage of the CFTA, uh, everyone in Europe would be very reluctant to um, think about any further perspective. And the, the truth is that the Georgian dream has unfortunately wasted eight years of um, the life of our life, basically, in, as far as Euro Atlantic integration is concerned. In my view, I will tell you, I think that the realistically speaking, not only for Georgia, but also for Ukraine and Moldova, the countries which have already uh, basically exhausted in, in terms of contractual relationship uh, have already achieved the maximum that the Eastern Partnership can offer at this point. The next perspective should be probably something like common economic area with the European Union, uh, which, which basically means greater level of European integration. Uh, as far as for the membership application is concerned, actually what that means is that Georgia should become a candidate country. And that of course uh, is uh, contingent completely on the political will in Europe, because on the one hand, yes, we have to be ready. And that means that there should be no concerns regarding the uh, judiciary or any other issues that we have taken obligation to um, address and to reform. Um, and on the other hand, the political will in the European capitals has to be there. But meanwhile, Georgia does not have to lose the time because basically what we can do is uh, start implementing the ACIS. I mean, in a sense to do a proactive, uh, proactive work take what the candidate countries have to do in the process of basically becoming a member and do all the work that we can, of course, you know, lacking the kind of support that the candidate countries have like structural funds and et cetera, but still we can do a lot and be really ready, you know, be really ready at the time when there is a political will in Europe to grant us the candidates mm -hmm. status because the worst, and I will end this with this, the worst that can happen for Georgia or any other country really is to, of course, apply for the candidacy and to um, not be granted the status. I mean, that would be really tragic. So um, it's a very complicated, complex road. And um, I realistically speaking, I doubt that anyone believes even the best friends of Georgia, that uh, what the Georgian dream is uh, promising is anything other than the empty pre-election promise. Thank you, Ms. Amadeshwili. And uh, Jonathan, I feel sorry that I've monopolized here this whole you know, conversation. Before we go to question and answer period, uh, we are getting already questions from our audience. Would you like also to jump in? Uh, to yeah, sure, thank you. And it was, it was good to hear about, um, um, about sort of the approach on the, on the EU. Um, one of the, you know, uh, I didn't hear NATO in that, in, in sort of that discussion. And I think that I know that still remains um, a priority uh, for Georgians as well when you look at polling in terms of Euro-Atlantic integration. Um, and so hopefully maybe that will come up. Uh, two things I wanna, <clears throat> just based on the intro statements, one was on uh, COVID-19 and, uh, and both Salome and, and Sergey and obviously Georgi can sort of weigh in. You both were, um, I think there's criticism um, of, of the government's handling of it, um, a second wave. Uh, this is something we're seeing across Europe, <clears throat> excuse me, in the United States as well. Uh, it was, came up in our debates last night. And, um, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, from, from opposition parties to the government, <clears throat> excuse me, what, what, is, what is your plan, you know, to address this? How do you, um, obviously it's a, it's a serious challenge. I wanted to hear a little bit more about your perspective and plan. And then going back to this question on, on Russia, <clears throat> excuse me, and Russian interference, I, I wanted to ask, um, and sort of all could but I wanted to pose it towards, towards uh, Georgi as well, really just to you. 
Uh, the charge is that the government isn't doing what it needs to do in sort of that pre-election period, but maybe also that we've seen, you know, a deepening of economic engagement uh, and that maybe uh, the approach is more open to, uh, to a relationship um, with Russia. And so I just wanted to ask, you know, sort of ask just to respond, particularly to this issue of, of, um, of you know, uh, the reports that have come out from Dossier and other investigative bodies about, uh, you know, funding of, of political parties and, you know, the government's response to that investigation and, you know, and, and how do, how is the government responding to it? And then how uh, should, you know, how can Georgia strengthen its capacities to address this challenge? Because it's not going to go away. In fact, I think it's a pr pretty, I think maybe with Sergey, one of you said it's a pretty vulnerable period because of the challenges that you see in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. You also see instability in the United States politically. Um, so there's, and, and that bleeds into the transatlantic alliance and ability to address these challenges. So I guess two questions, one's domestic, because I think the question is how do you approach COVID-19? What are your plans? You know, what would be your party's plans to, you know, to address that challenge? Um, I, I just want to say, you know, Vice President Biden last night did lay out what his, you know, what his administration would do and has been very forthright. Um, and, uh, and so, and the Trump administration has its plan. So I wanted to sort of ask you, and I, I don't want to connect the conversations, but we're actually, we're all talking about very similar things in our elections um, that you guys are talking about as well. It's one of those rare moments where sort of globally, we're all kind of dealing with similar issues at a very domestic level. So, so I, that, though, those will be my two questions. And I see that we have others coming in too um, that, that touch on some of the pre-election issues um, and concerns that you raise. And, and, and just perspective of somebody, former US government official, you know, um, I know that there have been pledges that have been signed by the political parties to, to ensure that the pre-election environment is one where there's no violence, um, where the focus is on ensuring that, you know, the conversation is with voters. Uh, I just hope that those pledges are, are upheld and, and um, I can see the headlines. And I think we're all reading the headlines from Georgia, but on the, on the main two issues, I just wanna get back to COVID. Uh, you know, what the two, uh, two opposition parties think may be a way forward. And then, uh, Georgia, you can obviously jump in on that, but also um, sort of the disturbing trend of, of increased Russian interference directly into a, a major political party um, that theoretically could, you know, could be part of, you know, of a government. So how do we, how, how does that square and how do you address that challenge, Georgi, from Georgia Dream and what, what's happening right now? Thank you. So we start from Georgi. Thanks. Um, well, uh, let me start with the COVID-19 thing. Uh, well, uh, our approach to COVID from the very beginning was strictly science-based and uh, very professional. And this was just a, a cohort of very experienced uh, virologists and uh, the institutions, research institutions, as well as medical institutions to take to, who took the lead uh, in this respect. And that's why we had uh, this stellar uh, performance in the spring. But the interesting thing is, and I, and I said before, I mean, this is, this, is going to be the, the, uh, this is going to be the same this autumn, I believe, and then uh, next spring as well. But I mean, what is interesting, and I will just uh, uh, stop uh, talking about COVID here. Uh, what is interesting is when the uh, disease was exceptionally well managed in spring, the opposition did not stop their complaints and their attacks against the government and their attacks against those professionals working in the field. So it's pretty much plus a change. So whatever Georgian government does, the opposition uh, never gives any credit, never appreciates any of the achievements and uh, it's basically a knee-jerk reaction just to criticize anything that the government does so this is unfair as for the russian interference this is a great question um, which is constantly raised uh, and I, I believe there is a uh, certain uh, influence in georgian uh, uh, politics but there is one indicator there is uh, uh, let's talk numbers 
in 2016, in the during the previous elections, the support for the Russian-oriented parties in Georgian politics stood at about 8.5%. So one party got into the parliament, the Alliance of Patriots, and another party uh, uh, just got a lower, uh, uh, did not quite get the threshold. Now with the most accurate, what we, what we consider most accurate um, polling, uh, the number of uh, um, the people who support these pro-Russian parties is essentially halved. So then when we are talking about Russian interference, then whatever they are doing in Georgia seems to be counter uh, uh, counter uh, productive because they are losing uh, the minimum ground that they enjoyed before. So in that sense, I mean, one most uh, dangerous thing in Georgian politics, which to me directly indicates to Russian interference is um, the emotional charge of the pre-election campaign, uh, every, every actually public issue, which is instantly politicized uh, and it is basically the vitriolic tone from some of the um, actually uh, party run televisions. Um, and then um, we know on the US side that Russian interference, if there was one, and it's up to you to judge, I'm, I'm, I'm not really making my judgment here, then it was exactly directed towards raising the political temperature so that people don't trust their rational calculations, their interests, but actually make decisions out of their emotional uh, state and uh, especially distrust towards the government. Um, as for, and I also wanted to briefly touch one issue that was constantly raised here, a couple of times at least, and that was election uh, violence. Actually, um, the most pronounced two cases happened in uh, southern Georgia, in, in, a, 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 in Marneuli, and in both cases, the incidents happened inside the headquarters of the Georgian Dreams, of the Georgia, of Georgian Dream Party, when the opposition activists came uh, aggressively to, uh, to actually attack the Georgian Dream headquarters. And that is, I think, uh, 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 the indication of uh, uh, the, where these skirmishes originate. Um, and uh, I want to reassure you, uh, assure you that in, in each case, the investigation is fully under, uh, uh, underway. And then all perpetrators, regardless of their party affiliation, will be punished what they, for what they have done. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Sergey, please. Uh, OK, on the COVID, uh, um, I think uh, uh, well, we just put forward our plan for that uh, uh, in the post-election period. There are several things that need to be done. The first one is uh, the um, what do we call the, the prompt response. Uh, the big problem we have right now with the increasing numbers is that people are panicking uh, when they're calling 112 or when they're calling the doctors, uh, nobody's picking up. Um, and so, so I think that is one thing. and. Uh, one of the major things that needs to be done swiftly is to integrate the institutions of the 112 and the family doctors so that the initial response is uh, fast, is uh, on the spot, and that also does not contribute to the pandemic. The second one is uh, when it comes to the actual uh, medical uh, treatment, uh, we uh, uh, do not yet have the division of the COVID hospitals and non-COVID hospitals, and it's quite clear that uh, it just just two days ago, it was uh, stated that this would happen, but obviously the time we had gained uh, in uh, uh, from April until September was not used for that. Uh, and it also leads me to another point, which is the uh, preparedness and the equipment of the medical personnel. I think the biggest challenge we're facing right now is the uh, infection rate of the medical personnel. I think we just had 160, if I'm not mistaken, medical personnel infected just now. And if that is the case, and if we come up with the field hospitals and we don't have uh, uh, sufficiently equipped and trained uh, medical personnel for that, then we are poised for a disaster. And, uh, and, I'm, and you know, we saw what happened in other countries and this is quite uh, uh, visible that this could also happen here. So the other one would be giving the uh, safe places or the safe um, isolation places for those who are 
unable to, um, uh, uh, you know, th those who need it, whether these are the uh, old elderly uh, people or whether the ones who uh, are in the risk groups. Um, because right now, a lot of people live in the same families. If one of them gets infected, it's quite highly likely though they will get infected as well. And the other one is the economic, uh, economic uh, response to that. Uh, that would lead me to a long discussion but I think the, the way um, the money was spent in, in these last three or four months uh, is uh, not, not justifiable. Um, the, the money was not spent to maintain the uh, economic stability of the middle class. The money was not spent to, to ensure that it went to those who suffered most from COVID. I'll just give you one example. 200 lares were uh, given to every child before 18. I mean, honestly, this has nothing to do with the COVID response. It looks a lot like vote buying. Uh, not of these children, but of their parents. Uh, and the way this was done is not the way to counter the, one of the biggest crises we've had in our history, to be without any exaggeration. Uh, on the other issue, uh, which was mentioned here about the, the violence and, the, and, the, and, and in, in general about the election, pre-election environment and the violations, well, uh, without going into a, uh, a debate here, look, we have not had a single case where the perpetrator of the violence was actually punished, not just now, but neither before, not a single case, okay? So when, when we hear from the government representatives that the, all the perpetrators will be punished, I wonder when that will, uh, will come. You know, they have not been punished. The ones who, have, who, who, who perpetrated the beating of the opposition activists, etc., the biggest the punishment they got was a you know, $150 fine. And come on, that is not how you punish the, the perpetrators of the violent acts. Uh, the other one, you know, we just had the, uh, the, the case in the south of Georgia, as Georgi mentioned, where a civil society activist and a journalist were beaten up. What happened to those people who beat them up, including the head of the local council who is uh, from Georgian Dream? Nothing happened to them. So all these things that the people will be punished sometime in the future, that never happens. And that's what contributes to this violent atmosphere before the, before the elections, because those who perpetrate it do not ever get punished. That is the rule of thumb here in Georgia. And the only thing and the only and, and the only reason why we do not see the massive oppression of the opposition leaders at that is probably the March 8 agreement, which was negotiated by uh, uh, you know by the opposition parties and the government with the help of our international partners. And I think that's one of the things that prevents them from doing the same things they did in 2016 or 2018, when the opposition offices were raided massively, when our leaders were beaten up in front of the cameras. Oh yes, thank you, this is not happening now, but neither those people who did that have been punished. So yeah, this is a serious, serious problem. We don't want that to happen. And as for the polarization before the election, as I said before, uh, polarization is not good, but that's how it happens here. The importance is uh, that, well, the important thing is that that polarization does not translate into violence. Okay, and then the final comment, it was mentioned here that some of the media are, are, are are doing the are contributing to the polarization. Well, guys, I really hope you never get to watch media like Imedi TV, which is the pro-government media, because you will see what the polarization means there. You will see how demonized the opposition there is, how one-sided it is, and please, nobody, uh, don't even dare to compare it with the Fox and CNN. It is not that. It is the Soviet-style propaganda that we see on the only uh, one of the few government-owned channels. I'll stop here. Thank you, sir, Sergey. And uh, now I'm going to Madame Samadashvili. And I would really like to um, you to be kind of you know two three minutes to um, okay. be, and right. also uh, to cover the okay. question that Jonathan has asked about the Russia maybe and Russian okay. influence. I, I will program. cover. I will cover that for sure um, because. But I just wanted to follow up very briefly on the last thing that Sergey said on the media. Uh, because the representative, uh, newly recruited representative of the Georgian dream now uh, has claimed in this discussion that they're winning the elections. And, um, you know, yes, they're winning the elections only in the polls conducted by the uh, Imedi TV, um, you know, Rustavi 2 TV, which basically government controls. Um, Rustavi 2 was, of course, taken away from its uh, legal owners. Um, and uh, there is like a parallel, when we're talking about polarized society, it's because there are parallel realities in this country. One in which the government, you know, exists and their supporters, they watch those TV channels. 
And on those TV channels, Georgia is defeating pandemic and they are winning the elections. But the reality, when I go out and campaign throughout the country and meet you know, hundreds of voters is very, very different. And let me tell you what is the reality there and what we should do to change that. So to answer the question about the COVID, I won't talk extensively, but you know, there is like, a, you know, basically there are four stages of dealing with COVID. One is preventing the disease. The second is, um, you know, detecting the disease. The third one is containing. And the final one is of course, treating the disease. So let's start with preventing what we would do differently. We are now entering the flu season here in Georgia. And you cannot find flu shots in this country unless you have connections or you're willing to bribe someone maybe to get one because basically the government never bothered to develop the, um, you know, the, the needed, um, needed um, reserves of the flu shots which are necessary. Uh, in terms of the detection, you know, the government has never trained or prepared people who will be caseworkers in terms of, you know, detecting the context, which is key. And I know it is a problem in many countries, but, you know, this is again something which we could have done effectively. What about, uh, you know, uh, the uh, management system where basically right now, if you needed help and you were calling 911, there is a good chance no one would answer because basically it's completely mismanaged and the system is collapsing. So at either stage of deten detention or containing, there is absolutely mismanaged system. Uh, and I will not go, to, go into the final stage of treatment because, okay, this is something which the, is up for the scientists. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Khalashuli has mentioned that their approach has been scientific. Well, I'm afraid that it was not very scientific and they have tried actually to politicize the process because the scientists that the government put in charge of the process of managing the whole pandemic issue, they were showing us up as party supporters for the Georgian dream and basically campaigning for them. And of course, as a result, what has happened is that these people have lost their credibility completely. And today, when the same people who were telling us just a few months ago that Georgia has defeated Georgian dream under Ivanishvili's leadership has defeated the pandemic, now are telling us that actually we're entering the real you know, spread stage of the pandemic. Of course, nobody knows what to believe. And therefore many people in this country are, I mean, I want to just explain how the government has lost completely the credibility and I think the good place to start for the new government is to build the credibility with the people. So at least our voters and you know, citizens of Georgia believe what we tell them about the pandemic because we have reached the point where basically nobody believes anymore what the current government is telling them about the virus. And this is a huge problem. I will not, uh, because there are many questions and time is short, I want to go into the Russian uh, question and you know the influence of the of Russia's influence in the country. Um, you know what has been really happening is that uh, the Georgian dream uh, in 2016 uh, it was the Georgian dream that that decided to um, have Patriots Alliance, the satellite party really of the Georgian dream, uh, in the parliament because. I want to remind you the way the system worked then you have to you had to pass the threshold electoral threshold to get into the parliament. And there were two parties which basically were near the passing the threshold, but it was not clear if they have passed the threshold. One was the Patriots Alliance, which was identified as Russian funded and supported party recently through various documents. And the second one was the party of Irakli Alassania, who many of you know, who used to be a close ally of Ivanishvili when he came into power in 2012, but then left the alliance because he started doubting that Ivanishvili was truly committed to the pro-Western agenda. And when Ivanishvili basically had to give an instruction to the Central Election Commission, which party passed the threshold, he decided that it was the Patriots Alliance that should end up with the seats in the parliament. And uh, this was, you know, a direct decision of the Georgian dream to basically strengthen 
the party, which is uh, now openly, you know, we know openly funded from Russia. In terms of the pro-Western orientation of this government, I want to um, remind you that since 2012, all major allies of Ivanishvili, you know, I mentioned Alessania, David Yusupashvili, everybody else, who basically were talking to you in Washington, in Brussels, everywhere else on behalf of Ivanishvili, they have left the Georgian dream. They have left Ivanishvili because they have realized that he is moving this country into a different direction. In 2016, Ivanishvili recruited the new group of pro-Western young politicians, whom many of you, I'm Someone sure, have sorry, met. but we are running out of time. Please, if you can yes. make sure. Uh, that many of you have met in Washington and in Brussels. And they have also left Georgian dream because uh, they, you know, once uh, Vizina eventually decided to go back on the promise on the proportional system of elections. So the reality is that, you know, even initially on every round when he wants to, you know, be in power in this country, finds people who speak on his, his behalf to the Western audiences. But then the reality that is happening on the ground in our country is actually increasing Russian influence, both in terms of the security presence, economic presence, political presence. And this is the reality which we need to put an end to uh, in, the, in, in one week when the elections come, um, you know, give us a chance to actually vote out even surely together with all his, um, you know, all his political allies from the, from the government. Thank you. Thank you. And we have to, we have a questions already lined up. I'm afraid we won't be able to answer all of them, but there is a specific question. So one uh, going to Georgi um, from uh, David Kramer. Um, the question concerns growing attacks against civil society. And can Georgi comment on that and explain whether GD condemns these attacks, which seem to be coming from pro-government outlets? And then uh, there is also another question, which is specifically for Sergei Kabanadze regarding the um, Karabakh from Hans Kutkot. And uh, it's in case of an escalation of Nagorno-Karabakh, I would be interested to hear how he sees the situation, especially for Georgia now, both from him and others. Like what difficulties Georgia may face in case of escalation of uh, MK conflict. Thank you. And uh, I really ask you to be really brief, uh, not more than two minutes, because we have to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. I, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm starting the, this uh, answer session. But, but first, I wanted to address this sort of uh, Russian interference claims from uh, Salome, who apparently uh, is right in that uh, some of them in the opposition are really living in a parallel universe in a sense of, uh, uh, as I said, the pro-Russian parties are the weakest uh, uh, ever in, in independent Georgia's history. Second, the integration with the European Union and NATO has never been stronger than now in terms of real cooperation, in functional sectoral cooperation with these organizations. Partnership, strategic partnership with the United States has never been better as well, in, especially in the security sector and in uh, some key other issues. And finally, democratic standards are, are improving and despite the uh, friendly um, uh, sort of uh, uh, criticism from some of our partners, which has always been the case since Georgia was independent. And then by international rankings, these standards are getting uh, better and better. So it's really, really uh, 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 sort of surprising, well, not to me, but uh, uh, probably for, for outsiders, what uh, the opposition is talking about. And, and uh, also briefly about demonizing uh, Vizina Ivanishvili. Um, I don't have particular urge now to whitewash him for any reason, but uh, because he holds the power together for the winning uh, uh, party, Georgian Dream, that's why he is constant a target of opposition smearing campaigns. And I think, I mean, at, at some other point, maybe we should have a better a forum for discussing his personal engagement with Georgian politics um, and uh, his contribution to democratization of the country. Um, as for David's, uh, David Kramer's, uh, and it's very good to have him here, 
uh, question about uh, civil so attacks against civil society. I would not necessarily call them attacks. I, I think there is a very vibrant discussion between civil society and the government at this stage. And civil society organizations, uh, from our point of view, show very strong anti-government bias. But I suppose that is how they uh, should be functioning. And then if you look at the, uh, the level of engagement of civil society in government's daily work, then I don't think you, ha you ever had this, this um, strong and this inclusive as, as ever before. I think ECA is one of representatives of such think tanks. And then with many other organizations, there should be uh, sort of levels that can be easily measurable of how this engagement is happening between the government and civil society organizations. Overall, I think this is just a very um, good story to, to, to tell, tell about the media freedom in Georgia, about civil society engagement in Georgia. It just has to be a calm and uh, sort of fact-based, evidence-based uh, conversation, not just uh, uh, Fitbit, political Fitbits. And in that case, I think we can uh, have a completely different uh, picture of government civil society cooperation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Georgi and Sergi. If you briefly will uh, touch upon the um, this question regarding the what threats Georgia might face in case of escalation of NK, which is actually you know, already escalating. Yes, uh, sure. The piece that uh, Hans uh, referred to was. Uh, the enumeration of the dilemmas and the questions that Georgia might face if Nagorno-Karabakh blew up and it has blown up. So the, all those questions are actually relevant right now. Uh, what I would say is the top priority right now is to focus that nothing uh, happens in terms of the ethnic uh, violence or ethnic strife internally in Georgia, taking into account that we actually have Armenian and Azeri populations, and they're both rooting for their own sites. And that is uh, a very delicate issue. Um, that is a very um, sensitive issue for them. And we, the political parties who have offices in all those regions, in both of those regions, you know, uh, we, for instance, uh, are very careful in making sure that um, no alienation happens. Um, locally and that they are not uh, and that this conflict uh, outside of Georgia does not translate into either the ethnic hatred internally or any kind of uh, status quo in which problems can arise. I think that is the number one top concern right now. Um, uh, that's one. The other thing uh, is that we uh, uh, need to make sure that the, the approach which has been uh, so far from the side of the government about the neutrality in terms of the intervention in the conflict, as well as uh, not allowing any um, uh, military transit through Georgia to either Azerbaijan or Armenia. That need to con needs to continue uh, before the elections and after the elections, because we cannot afford to take side in this conflict. And obviously, we cannot uh, hope to play a role of the mediator uh, because of all the problems related with the mediation in this kind of conflict, especially by the friends. And, and one, last but not the least, I hope, and that's not really linked to the question, but I hope that uh, the international community's involvement in this conflict will be swift enough and strong enough for it to stop. Otherwise, it will persist. And as I've said on a number of occasions in different venues, I don't know who will be the winner of this conflict, but I know that Georgia will be the loser for sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sergei. And we are already in, uh, going to end quite soon within a couple of minutes this so quite interesting discussion. And I would like to give to each panelist just maybe one minute for final thoughts. So in one sentence, um, what are you offering to Georgia's future? And I also wanted, I know we're short of time, but also as this is the joint event with GMF and our partners in the United States are watching it, it might be also interesting for them to hear from you, your position also in one sentence, what, um, uh, what is the specific topic, theme, initiative, tangible initiative that your parties believe the US assistance is necessary for Georgia's future? It's too, short questions and uh, I'm looking forward to hear short answers from you and we start now from Solomon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Madam uh, Samadashuli, can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, yes. So uh, what we're offering, uh, I mean, clearly Georgia faces what many developing poor uh, countries face, the same dilemma. On the one hand, the need to develop economy, and on the other hand, to maintain still quite strong uh, social assistance um, you know, web, because there are still uh, many people who need that in our country. So uh, to sum up, what we are offering uh, basically is a very ambitious economic reform lowering the taxes and we uh, basically are hoping in a few years time to achieve the level where Georgia will be the country which will have no uh, profit tax or no income tax um, but on the other hand you know we need to maintain as I said the social assistance uh, programs which are in place how do we plan to do it with the reduction of taxes that we are envisioning and we consider this necessary to develop economic growth uh, we envision it by cleaning up corruption and uh, cutting down on completely unnecessary bureaucratic charges, which the Georgian, uh, Georgian dream is wasting the Georgian budget on. On the Euro-Atlantic integration, of course, uh, NATO, we have not mentioned that. And for us, it is a priority to join NATO as soon as possible. And we will uh, put a new momentum in lobbying for membership in NATO. So that takes me to the, your question what the United States can do to support Georgia in the coming uh, years. Uh, I would say two priorities. One, it's NATO and cooperation in the field of um, defense and security, but also finishing something that we started under our government uh, and that's negotiation of free trade agreement. And uh, unfortunately, this question has been frozen for quite some time now and we certainly hope that uh, that you know we can move forward with it and finish it because Georgia, on the one hand, we plan to generate real economic activity in this country. And on the other hand, we intend to make Georgia independent of the Russian economy by actually using free trade agreements both with Europe and with the United States mm -hmm. to strengthen our independence. Thank you. Thank you. And Georgi, very briefly, we do not have practically any time. With the United States, I think it's security and defense and uh, help with uh, NATO. Uh, we are planning for sustainable economy and greater social safety for our citizens. A much stronger integration with the European Union, as the, which will be the focus of all government efforts and programs. And uh, also, most importantly, this is uh, October is 30th anniversary of our first free elections. And this should be the future for Georgians, because this is what we have chosen 30 years ago, and Georgian dream will lead the country to much greater democracy than, than ever before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Georgi and Sergi. Oh, one uh, minute. In one minute uh, on the US part, uh, it's, the, it's the strong involvement and assistance of the democratic development in Georgia, I think, uh, uh, whatever the government formation in the next uh, post-election period there will be the strong U.S. Uh, watchful eyes extremely important for us. Uh, second one, security, NATO membership and assistance there. And the third one on the economic field, I think we can do better when hosting the American investors here. We've had the serious problem in the last years, unfortunately, with that. A number of American investors have, have suffered here. Uh, that needs to be reversed and hopefully we will be able to achieve the free trade. Uh, with the United States. Um, on the other things, uh, once again, we don't have enough time to go through our party's economic program, but it would be the healthier economy, less bureaucracy, lower taxes, small government, uh, strong European integration, and a strong judicial reform, including the jury trials and also the foreign judges. That would be very, very briefly, but there is so much to it that it's very hard to even attempt to, 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 to try and, and touch that. But and, and in the end, Thanks for everyone uh, to for, you know for this uh, uh, interesting discussion uh, to Jonathan, to Eka, to Shota, and the others who have tuned in and asked the questions. I try to answer some of the questions privately uh, in the Q and A chat box. Um, hopefully, they were sufficient. Thank you, Sergey. And um, I was really happy to hear about the judiciary as well. And thank you, all the panelists, and thank you to the auditorium. And with this, I give a floor to Jonathan. I'm sorry for not leaving time for you. <laughs> 
Eka, no problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for moderating and partnering uh, with GMF, uh, which is uh, obviously has long been involved and engaged uh, in strengthening and supporting Georgia's democracy and security. And that includes through uh, GMF's Black Sea Trust and programs across both Europe and the United States. So this was really important. Um, we appreciate that you've taken time in a very busy schedule to join us and, uh, and to, I think, I hope uh, educate uh, both Georgians uh, further, but also those on uh, both in the transatlantic community about uh, the key challenges that are taking, that are both domestic, but also, uh, also your external challenges too. Um, and I'm just sort of reminded that there are some, there's a number of challenges right now that are probably directly impacting like Nagorno-Karabakh, the, the internal aspect of what's happening in this election. But mainly we wanna thank you again. We look forward to our next conversation. I can say on our end, we're committed to, uh, to doing all the things that you talked about, both in terms of the transatlantic attention um, and support and engagement for increased trade, uh, but also to, to move our futures uh, a future together. And uh, Georgia will remain a strategic partner and in interest of the United States and of Europe. And so we look forward to seeing what happens in the upcoming elections um, in the aftermath. And we wish all of you the best of luck in these uh, pre-election days um, as things move forward. So again, thank you, Eka. Thank you again. Uh, it, it's been great to, to co-host with you. And thank you for those people who have joined us um, early in the morning in, in Washington, but also those uh, who are joining in the afternoon, uh, wherever they are. So thank you to everybody again. Have, have a good you. rest thank of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you